Good morning. Thanks uh, to those of you that have just joined us and to those of you that have stuck with us since the early, early morning uh, 10 a.m. start that we did an hour ago with Paper Press Punch with their lovely presentation. Um, I am excited to introduce everyone to the Zine Archive and Publishing Project, the Zap Zine Collect Collection, um, which is a volunteer run organization dedicated to preserving and promoting self publishing in Seattle and beyond. Uh, Zap has collected more than 30,000 zines, mini comics, and other self published and small press titles, which were originally donated um, to the Seattle Public Library by the Richard Hugo House back in 2017. Um, Abby Bass and Shelley Mastellers. Uh, are two librarians who work closely with the collection at Seattle Public Library's Central Branch, and I'm happy to introduce them this morning um, and take it away. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Abby Bass, and as, I, as Tom mentioned, I'm a librarian here at the Central Library in the Arts, Recreation, and Literature Department. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And I've been working with the Zap Zine Collection here at the library for the last four years. Um, prior to that, I was a volunteer with Zap when it existed. It did cease to exist as an organization in 2017 when Richard Hugo House donated the collection to the library. So I just wanna make that clear. Um, it's unfortunately no longer in existence, but I'm very glad that we are able to still make this collection available to the public. Um, I also I am here today with my colleague Shelley. Um, Shelley, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Shelley Mastalish. I'm a teen services librarian at the Central Library, um, and I've been working with the collection, I guess, the same amount of time. Um, uh, but I do uh, I work with more uh, middle school and high school groups that come to the library who want to um, explore the Zap collection, who are making their own zines. Um, and there's also a small circulating um, zine, uh, uncat zines in the um, teen center at the Central Library. So that's how I kind of got into this as well. And I use she, her pronouns. I don't know if I mentioned that. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, before we get into looking at some of the publications that I've set aside for us to look at today, um, I'm going to be doing most of the talking and showing zines from the collection. And Shelley is going to be putting some links in the chat while I'm talking, but we'll both be available to answer questions at the end of this presentation. Um, but first of all, for those of you who are not familiar with the term zine or know what zines are, I'm assuming many of you do, but just in case there's someone who doesn't, just want to give a brief definition that we often use, which is that zines are small handmade magazines made out of passion and not for profit. Um, they feature voices that are rarely heard in the mainstream media, and they can be made by anyone about anything for any reason. And just to give you it sort of they really vary in terms of production um, and size and all, all factors. I mean, they really look very different depending on who's making them. And I'm gonna show a few examples later, but just to give you an example of just a basic zine, this is a local zine, Urban Hermit, which is uh, Xerox black and white um, with hand lettered writing and staple bound. That's like the most basic zine. Um, here's a little more color cover, a little fancier. This is also by a local author. And this is a zine about the monorail that was published in the nineties. This one, they actually used um, kind of a, letterpress or not letterpress they used a desktop publishing to lay that out but this also is a zine and this if you looked at you might think oh that looks like a book it's perfect bound it's got offset printing this actually has a letterpress cover um but this is also a zine this was actually created at the independent publishing resource center in portland and I think they're actually going to be at one of the panels for Make Ready on May 21st at 5 p.m. So I highly recommend and encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about zines, uh, go check out their talk, um, their panel. They were really an inspiration to the Zap volunteers in terms of what they were doing and still continue to do. So a little bit more about Zap. Um, as Tom mentioned, Zap stands for Zine Archive and Publishing Project. It was a volunteer run organization that was a program of Hugo House. Um, starting in 1996 and up until 2014. 
An essential part of Zapp's mission was to collect and maintain a library of zines, mini comics, and other self-published and small press titles from the Seattle area and beyond. Um, so it's a really, really deep archive of um, Seattle's underground literary music and political culture from like the 1970s up until the 2000s. Um, and it's also a really great inspiration for folks who make comics or involved in the local art community. There's a really fabulous comics collection in within this collection of local artists. And we'll see a few of those today. Um, we'll see a lot of things that were created by people here. Um, and so how do you access this collection? Uh, Right now, well, the collection does not circulate and we have no plans to circulate it. Um, right now, the only way that you can access it is by visiting the Central Library and in the room that it's housed in, which I'm in right now, the which is on the seventh floor. And of course, right now we're not open to the public. We don't know when Central is going to reopen. We don't have a date yet. And it's pretty likely that this space will not be open right away, even after we do reopen. Um, so if you have any questions about when you might be able to access this collection again, please email us at scenes at spl.org and or if you just have any questions in general that we don't get around to today. Um, we are, however, currently cataloging everything in this collection, so it will eventually uh, be you'll be able to find and search for zines in the library's regular catalog. Um, and Shelly just put into the chat a link to everything that we've done so far, our catalogers have done so far, which is about 4,700 scenes, I believe. Um, and our catalogers have been working on that during the closure for the pandemic. But, and they've done a fantastic job. Um, I would just want to give thanks really briefly to the Friends of the Seattle Public Library and also the Seattle Public Library Foundation, whose generous support has made that cataloging effort possible. So without further ado, I'm going to get into showing you some zines from this collection, but I am going to just turn off my camera and start sharing on my phone. So that just might take a moment. Um, hang on with me as I transfer over. Okay, it looks like you can probably all see my screen. Can you still hear me pretty well? Give me a thumbs up if yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm not gonna be looking in the chat during this time. So hopefully Shelly will be able to uh, catch anything that comes up, but if not, we can answer stuff in the Q and A. So um, first I wanna start off by talking about the one page zine structure. Um, this is a very common structure. It's a really good entry into zines. And it is just made with one sheet of paper, usually eight and a half by 11, but you can use any size. Um, and I'll just sort of show you this structure. As you can see, it involves folding this page into eight sections and then cutting it and folding. Um, and this, I believe this structure is actually gonna be taught um, as part of a workshop later on in Make Ready. So, I just wanna give a few examples from this collection to sort of see, show you kind of what the range is of what people have made with this. This is about a history of men's underwear. Um, it's very charming, little hand written, hand illustrated. Um, some really great little illustrations here. I kind of love this one. And then another good example is, this is actually made by a local author, um, Mare Odomo, this, who's a pretty well-known cartoonist. Um, and this zine is about how to use um, worms to compost your trash. And what I really love about this zine is that it was made with an old, um, a reused old Whole Foods bag. So it's a really great way, an example of someone, you know, choosing a, a style or a format um, that matches the content. Um, yet another example of this one page zine is a uh, local, this was a zine that was created by a local literary arts collective called Les Sardines. Um, I don't believe they're around any longer, but they were around in the, the early 2010s. Um, and this, they have constructed a little cardboard sort of tin for all these zines, the one page zines. 
um, which are the same structure as what we've been just looking at. And you can see there's a whole range of stuff in here. I just wanna point out this one in particular, this is a zine that someone wrote about their experiences hiking. Um, and what I really like about this particular one is that they use both sides. So pull this up a little bit. You can see they on the, the inside, they have a green trails map replicated. So that's a great use of this particular format. And it's a way to sort of expand the size of what is a, usually a very short zine. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is a format that we use a lot for workshops for teaching people how to make their own zines. And this is a zine that was made in collaboration with Fogland Studios as part of our Summer Arts on the Plaza program at Seattle Public Library. Um, and this was screen printed on the plaza and then you no know, cut and fold. And so people got to take this away with them. Um, another zine that was made in a workshop here is uh, this zine. I'm a trans girl. Um, this was a young trans woman who came to this workshop and made this zine. And this was actually a workshop that we put together as part of the Washington State Zine Contest which is an annual contest. Um, it's open to anyone who lives in Washington state and there's different age categories. And this one actually won an honorable mention for the children's category and they have scanned it and put it online so you can read the whole zine there. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you want to learn more about how to make this structure, um, we have a couple pamphlets or templates that we really like that are available online. Um, one is the Center for Cartoon Studies. They have a really great template that just walks you through the steps involved. But also um, you could just search on Google for one page or one sheet zine. Or you could attend HOTAM's workshop, which is Saturday, May 22nd at 2 p.m. as part of this festival to see how that, to see it demoed and make one yourself. So these, you know, these little zines, these are still pretty small. They're about um, four inches tall and three inches wide. But I want to show you a few that are even smaller in this collection. This one, these little zines are about two inches tall and two, or two and a half inches tall and two inches wide. And this one has got a little friendship pen and it's just quotes um, that this author particularly enjoys. Uh, this format's great for someone who really wants to do like a really micro, tiny focusing. This author, Missy Kulik, um, is a zine creator from Pennsylvania, and each of her zine, little zines like this has a different theme, and this one is just dresses, her favorite dresses. So it's just illustrations of her wearing her favorite dresses. Very cute. Um, another example, this little plague zine, just drawings of different plagues. Seems appropriate for right now. Another small zine that I want to show um, that I really love is this literary zine called Little Elegy. Um, and this is one version of this zine, which is pretty standard. Um, again, it's typewritten. There's some illustrations. It's got a staple bound, as you can see. But they made a fancy version of this, which is on cardstock. And this came in its own little package. And it's the exact same content, but um, just sort of a different presentation. So those are some of the smallest zines in the collection. Um, another author from the Northwest who has really done a lot of interesting work um, with zine format and structure is Alex Reck, who's known for the zine brain scan. And this is a very early iteration of her zine. This was came out sometime in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and as you can see, it's a very basic black and white handwritten. This one doesn't even have a staple, um, just using a Xerox machine. This was issue number 12. By issue 15, she'd really kind of progressed in terms of the formats and techniques she was using. So this edition, this issue, um, each uh, issue had its own handmade envelope, which was made from, this one was made from an old map. This was probably from an old National Geographic. And if you open it, you get some more of these tiny little zines. And she also was, she uses this a lot in some of her zines, these sort of transparency covers printed on transparency and then staple bound, cut and paste. Um, 
you know, sort of looking like a typical zine, but in a much smaller format. Uh, by issue 20.5, she'd really moved on to something that I think looks more like a traditional artist book in a way. This, um, she's got a little cover for this and these pockets inside and inside, she's got a letter press printed, um, you know, set type description of the zine. She's got these tiny little zines in here. This one has, I don't know if anywhere, everyone can see that, but that is a, a electrical resistor that she's used to bind this scene. And I think that's such a great inventive binding technique, use of found materials. Um, she's got a little envelope, which she's taken from someone else and she's putting her zines in this envelope. Um, so really just a lovely collection of small pieces that all work together. Um, and another zine that I think is kind of in a similar spirit is this scene, which was a zine in the 90s that came out of Ohio. Um, it was edited by a librarian named Nancy Bonell Kangas. Um, and each issue had a different theme and featured like multiple con contributors. So she usually wasn't the only person who was writing this. Um, as you can see, this looks like it was probably offset printed cover with just um, another, just two colors. And if you open this, uh, she's got a little packet full of her contributors work. So everybody made their own little zine. Um, this was the inspirational uh, tract, inspirational and informational tract issue. So she kind of played with that and collected all these kind of little pamphlet type zines on different themes. Um, one of my favorites in here is reasons not to kill yourself. So it's good to have some reminders. Um, so yeah, that's another one like that. Uh, for a few more examples of really unusual techniques for containing zines, I want to show some really kind of strange ones. This first one, this there's a couple like this um, in the collection and they both resemble cigarette packs. And this one really plays with that structure. So the artist made a cardboard box that looks like a cigarette carton or cigarette pack. And then you can see that each of these little mini zines in here looks like what the cigarettes would look like if you open the box. So each of these comics actually is has something to do with smoking. It's about relating to themes of cigarettes and smoking. So a really smart kind of fun way to use that to make the zine. Another one that's sort of similar is this little guy called, this is known as Una, Unicornomicon, I may be mispronouncing that, but they're all little comics about unicorns. And what I really love about this is that they very helpfully included a tiny magnifying glass so that you can read these comics more easily. And they're just all sort of, you know, as you can see, this magnifying glass does help for those of us who are losing our vision. Um, they also did an interesting sort of binding structure in which they just folded all these little pages together and then taped it with this pink tape on the edge. And then last but not least in terms of these really sort of three-dimensional zines in the collection, this is a zine called Here is a Cupcake for You. And the creator used a toilet paper tube and just painted on the outside. And you can pull out the zine. It's a little hard to read because it's so curled up from being in this tube, but you can see this is a comic. This is a hand-drawn comic with that's held together by what looks to me like sort of an old binder staple. It's a little rusty, um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, I also wanted to show a couple uh, sort of unusual structures in terms of folding, paper folding. Um, and we mentioned Fogland Studios earlier, and this is another zine that they created. Um, I believe this cover, and I'm not entirely sure, certain what techniques they used for all of this, but I think that this cover was probably silk screened. Um, but as you open it, and I'm trying to move this up a little so you can see, it folds out 
into a larger piece. And then each of these folds out further. And I think each of these pages or half pages was drawn by a different local artist. Um, you can learn more about what they're doing. Yeah, you can see the list of artists in the back. Um, and you can see there's like Roberta Gregory and David Lasky and some other folks that if you're familiar with the local comic scene, you would probably recognize. Uh, another local author who I think did really interesting stuff in terms of folding is Gregory Hishak. He edited this scene, Farm Pulp, which was kind of a hodgepodge. So we kept it in the literature section in Zap. I don't know if that's the best category for it, but um, what, and he used, you know, very typical black and white um, Xerox and some kind of desktop publishing to do the layout. But what it was really interesting to me about this scene is how he uses different paper sizes and folds. So, you know, this is a smaller paper. Um, some of these, let me bring this up a little. Now I'll try to do this this way. Uh, you can see he's taken a longer page and folded it out to include another um, more text. And there's some other things later in here where he's like continued the text through the fold. Um, so just really kind of fun, unusual techniques that are maybe a little bit more advanced than what you might see in a very basic scene. Really a delight to look at. Okay, so that those are some kind of unusual structures and tiny zines. I'm next going to move on to talking about zines with unusual bindings. And first up is one of my favorites, 28 pages lovingly bound with twine. This is a personal zine that I think was around in the 2000s. Um, the, it's a father who lived in Ohio and as the title suggests, each issue was 28 pages long and was bound with twine and he just used twine um, and some paper hole punches. You can see here's another example of another issue with that same structure. So just kind of a fun, uh, you know, moving beyond just the cut, the typical staple format. Here is another zine um, that uses twine as well. This scene also uses kind of more, it's got a cardboard cover and each page was actually, this is a lot of very labor intensive zine. They've cut and printed their text onto um, sort of cardstock and then glued it onto another piece of paper, like a, a nice heavier printer paper. So this is kind of a fun one. Uh, another binding technique that's always great. This is a, another local art artist, um, Mita Mahato. And this is one of her early uh, cut paper comics. So she does a lot with kind of cutting and, coll and collaging. Um, and the theme of this is a sort of a sewing theme. It's related, you know, you can see there's patterns, um, and she's also playing on repetition in this, but I also really like how she just used a sewing machine to bind this scene. And that really fits in well with the theme. Oh, and also since we've got Kelly here, acknowledgements to short run, um, really sad that that's not happening right now, but I'm excited for them to come back when we all can be together again. Uh, this is another zine. So now I'm going to sort of move into zines that use more typical book binding techniques. Um, and this zine was created in the early 2000s uh, by folks who volunteered at Zap. And as you can guess from the title, this is a zine about going out to eat at local restaurants and not paying. And so they just sort of cataloged their exploits doing this. And it for those of you who've lived in Seattle for a while, you might recognize the names of some of these restaurants that are 
no longer around dilettante Broadway bar and grill. Um, it's, it's a funny little zine, uh, but what I wanted to point out here is how they use the pamphlet stitch was a, a very basic book binding technique to bind this zine. And they also kind of built a cover for it um, just using heavier cardstock. And then they use contact paper to cover it like a, a typical cover. So this is a really sort of fun little guy. Uh, another bookbinding technique that we've seen on some of our zines, not that many, but there's a few. This is a local zine created by Amber Gale of My Evil Twin Sister, which was a pretty well-known travel slash per zine that was her and her sister talking about their, um, their trips and their voyages around the world, but they were from Seattle originally. And she uses what's known as Japanese stab binding technique to pull together this little zine, which is about salmon in the Northwest. And she talks about um, Karkik, the daylighting of that. And so this was written like in the nineties. So it's, you know, a little out of date, but there's still a lot of good information in here and it's very well put together. Um, then Coptic Stitch, this is a zine that was created by Emily Larned who actually now teaches book binding and book design, book arts in, in Connecticut. And she uses the Coptic stitch to bind together this zine, which is a bunch of little sort of pamphlets. But as you can see, the inside is just, you know, typical. I think she laid this out by hand and she used um, a word processor to write this and then just cut and pasted the images. Um, but she did do the cover was a letterpress cover um, and yeah, it's kind of a fun little one. Another zine that uses Coptic stitch. This is Indulgence. This is a per zine created by Eleanor Whitney, who lived in Portland for a while, Portland, Oregon for a while. She's originally from Portland, Maine. And so she's sort of talking about her life on, in both Portlands. And she used this Coptic stitch to kind of create these sort of mini books within the zine itself. Uh, and last but not least for binding techniques, I want to show a very unusual binding, which um, this is a zine that's called, oh, what was this one called? I think it's called, um, oh, Spot the Moment, right? And this is by Alexandria Vickery. This was made in 2015. She's a local artist. And she, as you can see, used a twig um, and just kind of punched holes in this manila folder and tied the twig on. And that's how these pages are staying in here. So it's really, and people can get really creative in terms of what they use to find zines together. And I hope that these are giving you some fun examples. Okay, it looks like we have another 10 minutes. Is that right for this part before we move on to Q&A? So I'm just gonna briefly show folks some examples of interesting covers um, and techniques that were used to make Kind of unusual zines. Uh, first is the zine Art Freak. This is an you know eight and a half by eleven cut uh, folded over zine, but it's as you can see, it's very um, creative in terms of what she used for her materials. Uh, this again has a transparent cover, but underneath there's kind of a color reproduction. And then she's got some really nice tissue paper in here. She's got a lot of little add-ons and a fun pack of little prizes that she put in the back um, for readers. And within here, she each of her issues, she talks about different art making techniques and she includes samples of her work. So this is actually um, using a credit card to paint. And she used a credit card to put the paint on this little cardstock that she's included in her zine. Um, in terms of locally made zines that use interesting printing techniques, first I'm gonna show Ong Ong. This was a zine that was made in the mid 2000s. Uh, most of it was actually created at Zap. Um, Zap also had a space that people could work on their zines and we provided there was a copy machine that people could use. There were scissors, glue sticks, long arm staplers, anything you would need to put a zine together. So folks would often come there and work on their projects. And 
this is a zine that was lived, uh, edited by Lucy Morehouse and a lot of different authors and artists from the area contributed. I just wanna show this one as an example of what a screen printed cover can look like for a zine, um, just a two-tone screen printed cover. And she also always included a CD in the back um, with a little description of what's on there. Uh, another issue of Ang Ang that uses a different technique. This is again, the 2000s, so like stenciling was getting pretty big. So this is a stenciled and like spray painted cover. Um, and yeah. Uh, so a couple more of zines that were made at Zap. So once Zap moved, Zap actually parted ways with Hugo House in 2014 and they moved into, I think, Shunpike. Um, and they continued to do uh, zine making workshops and collaborative zines. And this is one that was created um, by some Zap volunteers and also other local artists and writers. But I just want to show this. This is an example of risograph printing. Um, and I believe there's going to be a workshop on risograph printing that is taking place on May 29th at 2 p.m. Um, and that looks like a great workshop. And I would encourage any of you who want to learn more about this technique to go to that because I honestly don't know that much about it. I'm probably going to go myself to learn a little more about how it works. But this was um, John Horn from Fogland Studios also did this cover. And this is another issue that was put together during that time, I think. Um, this is again, use of cardboard as a, as a cover material. And they've also included this cute little mini zine that's sort of sewn in there. Um, and I believe this was just a screen printed dual tone cover. And a few more examples screen printing. This is a local perzine called New Year. It was created by a woman who grew up in Seattle named Hope. And I really love the scene because she's taken the screen printing to another level by doing it on fabric and then sewn it in using the pamphlet stitch again. But this is a really beautiful creation. And you can see that, like some of these zine creators do addition their zines. A lot of people who are doing basic black and white Xerox staple down, don't do this, but folks who are making zines that take a little more effort and a little more care, often you'll see that they've got an addition on them. Uh, one more example of a sort of interesting cover technique. This is another brain scan. This is number 13. She, um, Alex, for this cover, she clearly did some kind of either a lino cut or a wood cut. Um, that she printed and then she sewed it onto this handmade paper. And it's again on the inside, it's still this standard black and white photocopied scene, but really nice cover. And each one was different. This is another example that she didn't do the um, handmade paper, but she still sewed on the cover illustration. Last but not least, I want to end with a favorite <laughs> of Zap. The Zap Collection, this is a zine that was made by one of the founders of Zap, Chuck Swaim. Um, and he made this, I think, sometime in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And yes, this is an actual piece of um, lunch meat that this zine is about 20 years old. And he shellacked this piece of lunch meat. That's on the cover. This is a pretzel. This is photo negative, a piece of string. So really, you can be very creative with your cover design. and it will still hold up. That, okay, I think that's all I wanted to show today. So we're gonna stop sharing from there. And, um, I just wanna say that if these have inspired you to make your own zine, we have some resources that we highly recommend for folks who aren't familiar with this format and want to get started. Um, one really great printed resource, which we actually have in the collection you can check out is Sh Stolen Sharpie Revolution, which was published by Alex Rack, who did the brain scan zine. It's a really great beginning, um, a really thorough uh, 
overview of how to create your zine and distribute it and all of that. And we've also um, put together a resource list of materials in the collection that you can check out the either books about zines or book compilations of zines. This was a list we put together for an exhibit we did it a couple of years ago that was highlighting this collection. So I, I would encourage you to check any of that out too. And that's all I had to say today. So more than happy to hear any questions or comments. Thanks, Abby. We do have a few questions um, in the section. The first one was by Joyce. Um, and that is, sorry, I'm kind of scanning back. Oh, how are the books in the collection obtained? And then Elizabeth had a follow-up question, um, curious about the curation. What do you seek out for the collection? If there are any kinds of things you are less interested in collecting slash preserving, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are not actively collecting anything for the zine collection right now. Um, folks have approached us and if you have something that you want to donate, unfortunately we don't have a budget at the moment to expand this collection and personally I would really like to be paying creators for their works. This collection when it was started it was all it's always been donation. Everything that's in there right now was donated. Um, I don't think that Zap ever paid anyone and I could be wrong about this, after, that may have happened after I left, but during the time that I was involved, which was about 2003 to 2007, it was all through donations. Um, but however, since now this collection is part of a larger institution that does have a budget to purchase materials, I would hope that we would somehow down the line be able to do that. In the meantime, we are taking donations um, for things that kind of fit the nature of this collection, I would say we're really interested in stuff that is locally created um, that's uh, sort of helping represent the literary and artistic culture of Seattle now or in the past um, and also anything that's political or music related anything that's sort of local that's I think more of what we're interested in because we have limited space um, zap was a little bit broader in terms of what they collected but I think because we don't have a ton of space, we'd want more local stuff. And so we actually have a question related to that, which is, do you accept zine donations or work made in the 1980s Seattle from Maryland? And so um, what Abby just said, you can also, um, to get something started or to kind of take a look over that, you can send something at zines at spl.org and we can kind of have sort of conversation around that. Um, I don't know if you have anything to follow up with that, Abby. And then the other question was from Tom, which was uh, related to the questions. I think you kind of covered this is, um, are you still continuing to grow the collection or is it limited to the original Zap collection? Which yeah. already covered. So. And actually, do you wanna talk a little bit about the circulating collections at the one at Central, just to give it that information? Sure, yeah. Um, so there's actually two circulating um, uncat collections. Um, unfortunately, they're not circulating now because they are on catalog. So there's no way of knowing um, what we could get out to people. So one is at the Central um, Central Library in the Teen Center. Um, and that I came um, into SPL um, around 2015. And that collection was already started, I believe, by you, Abby, right? And a few up. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I kind of inherited that. Um, and basically they are like, we have like, we have uncatalogued books, like books that you can just take without a library card and you can give them back. They're kind of based on um, that system. Um, so it's definitely dwindled over the years because I don't think, I think some people maybe keep the ones that they really enjoy. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I started, um, I think we have about still, maybe about 75 left. Um, I did start to actually have a, like a, um, just a Google uh, Excel spreadsheet so that I could kind of keep track of all the titles that are in there. The other um, collection is at the university district um, in the teen center as well. And those are for um, teens to early young adults. Um, and again, local artists are the people that we're highlighting from. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, Tom follows up with the question of how do you approach cataloging such a wide range of content and material? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I wish we had one of our catalogers <laughs> you are. here because we're, we're not as involved in that process. We're more on the public facing end of things. Like we're, um, you know, doing the, the open hours and, or, and running programs and doing outreach. Like go, we usually table it short run and bring some zines from this collection with us uh, for folks to look at. But um, I think there's actually a pretty robust community of zine libraries out there and folks have really come up with a lot of really well-developed standards for how to catalog zines. Uh, it's, it's not that different than cataloging any other material, except that sometimes it's really difficult to find out who made a zine or, you know, what the title is because it's not always clear. So those are sort of more of the issues I think people run into. And then there's also a lot of ethical issues in terms of Many people who've created zines never intended for them to end up in a library. Um, I'm sure that there are zines in this collection that we will probably hear from the creators at some point that they don't want us to keep this in the collection. And at that point we would remove it um, because most of the stuff in this collection was donated by someone else. Um, they didn't have any say in the matter. And because a lot of zines can deal with very personal and private topics. Um, that's not something that we would want to continue to make available if folks were not comfortable with it. Shelly, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, and then also sometimes we talk a little bit about like what is a zine, you know, <laughs> sometimes we have to go through some, some Certain, certain pieces that are like, is this or isn't, isn't this? And it's kind of like a, a general conversation. So those can be kind of interesting. Yeah, and I think it's been really interesting for our catalogers who had never really handled material. Like none of them come from, were really involved with the zine community. As far as I'm aware, that might not be true for everyone, but a lot of them just didn't have any background. So they're really learning a lot about the medium and the folks who make zines and kind of the history of the format in the process of cataloging. So we have two follow-up questions. So what is a zine by Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> and then Jamie asks, do zines need to be serial publications or intended to be serial? Um, well, I'll answer the second one first because that's the easy one. Uh, no, they don't need to be serial. There's plenty of zines that are just a one-shot, one-time thing. Um, and I think like that, early example, I don't know if you were here for the beginning of this talk, but the one about the history of men's underwear, I'm pretty sure there was no follow-up to that. That was just one time when they really wanted to make a little zine about that. And so they did. As far as what is a zine, again, I think it's one of those things that it's kind of like, you know it when you see it. Um, of course, that's very vague. It's very vague. It's a lot of subjective judgment, but I think for me, the, the really the, the key issue is someone is someone making this because they are called to do so. They're doing this out of their own, the need to, to express their voice or share something with the world. And that they, they're not really particularly interested in making money um, or even having a huge widespread readership. It's more about the need to share in a very personal and handmade way. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, they can be very elaborate. Like this zine is, you know, when I first started making zines as a 12 year old in the 1990s, I would have never even thought of this as a zine. This would be a book to me. But the, I think as people have gotten to have more access to technologies like Risograph or even Letterpress Studios, um, people have upped their game in terms of their uh, presentation. And Elizabeth follows up with the, uh, I mean, maybe the better question is what good question mark in parentheses use can um, artists make from this name SAS category maybe? That is a good question. I mean, I think, and you know, I'd be, I think, Ho, Tim, who's going to talk a little bit more about zines in his workshop might also have some really good answers to this. 
question, but I think I, uh, folks I know who have sort of moved into book art, making books as artist books from the zine world, they really like to go back to this format as a kind of like quick and dirty way to, to test out something or to make something that's maybe not um, as carefully, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but I think it's, it's a good way to sort of play around with techniques without really investing a lot in terms of like, you know, typesetting a whole page or using really expensive paper, um, which I know a lot of um, book artists do use. So this is kind of a fun way to play around with some techniques before maybe you would use them in a, like an addition to artist book. I'd be curious to hear what other people think about this because I personally am not a book artist. So I think, you know, folks who do zines who also identify as book artists would have a lot of things to say about that. Yeah, and I was just going to add on, I was, when we were talking about this um, presentation, I said some of my favorite zines are the ones that are like actually like, graf like graphic novelists of today. And it's just cool to see how they work with those different formats from a, a like a physical, like printed graphic novel versus a zine. Um, I just think it's really great. Yeah, I think one thing that if folks are searching for as this as this collection gets cataloged, you'll start seeing more of those early zine examples of graphic novels in this collection as well. So like American Born Chinese by Jean Luang Yang, which was like one, the Prince Award is a very well known like YA graphic novel. He started out making these as like little mini comics that he just, you know, printed, went off and printed at the local copy shop. And so it's really cool to see that and then see how it turned out as a book. And I, I think we're, we're planning to, we've used that a little bit in some of our programs, but we hope to do more with that to sort of show younger folks how you can start somewhere and end up in a different place using means. I think another good one is the, um, what is it? The travel, there was a travel one from Oregon, Portland, Oregon. I can't forget, and that turned into a book as well, yeah. So there's just some really cool examples. Uh, so Robert mentions there's a great zine librarian code of ethics here. Um, Elizabeth is very, she says, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to gender you. Um, is there any advantage to calling something or one the other? So like books versus I think zines is mentioned in there. Um, I mean, I don't know. What do you, what would you say about that? I think it depends on like what, what your, like who your, your intended audience is um, and what you're hoping, how you're hoping people will perceive your work. That is my answer, but I don't know, Shelley, would you add something to that about using book or zine to describe? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just, yeah, I do feel like the zines to me just feel like just a little bit more organic in a way, not organic, but like, yeah, it, it comes from this just desire to share something about you or about the world that you think people should know more about. And not that books don't do that either, but they, I just think zines kind of, we talk about them as ephemeral, right? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're meant for a certain time and a certain place sometimes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's just some thoughts around that. Um, wow, things are popping up. So I'm sorry if I skip, uh, don't notice some because I'm trying to get through some. Um, Robert, what kind of relationships exist between different zine libraries, both institutional and non-institutional? Um, I would say that relationships are pretty good. There's actually a whole community of zine librarians that has an annual zine on conference. Um, zine Librarian Unconference, and that includes folks who from all kinds of libraries, including people who are not affiliated with an institution at all. And my friend Milo likes to refer to those as barefoot librarians. Um, but everybody in that community is really generous in terms of sharing their knowledge and um, support. And it, actually, you can find a little bit more about what they do at zinelibrarians.info. Um, that gives some background on the conference and also just kind of different projects. And I think someone mentioned the Zine Librarian Code of Ethics and that, that was also something that was created by that group. So, yeah. 
Um, I think somebody, some people are responding to like, what is a zine versus a book? Um, let's see here. I'm just trying to see if there's any other questions, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good conversation going on about zines versus books. Um, so Joyce says, sometimes an artist's book is a collection of things that don't even involve paper, can be an installation, whereas where I think of a zine, I think more of a reproducible comic or graphic novel. Um, Elizabeth says, probably because of my age, zine connotates Xeroxing, staple binding, and kind of a cut and paste punk ethos, but obviously it's so much more. Um, yeah, so there's just a lot of good conversation going on on the side. Does anybody up have any more um, follow-up questions for our last maybe minute or two? <laughs> oh, go ahead, Robert, if you have a, you want to say something. I was just, sorry, I was just gonna ask, um, what are your wishes for like the Seattle zine scene? at present and your relationship to it? Well, I really hope, you know, that this collection, we can make it more accessible. I will, I'll say that like right now, I'm, I, I really, once the library is fully reopened, I really hope we can expand the hours that people are able to use this collection and, you know, kind of drink in what's here. And also we would love to make this space, not just a space that houses a collection, but a place where people can work on zines. Um, there's no way that we'll ever be able to replicate what Zap did. It was a really amazing community-driven organization um, and that did incredible stuff, but I would hope that we could at least continue their spirit, spirit of what they were trying to do. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm really excited for Short Run to come back because I think that that is such a key part of the zine and comics community here. Um, I mean, yes, they are still doing incredible work even during the closure, but I think there's something about that festival that is just so inspiring and energizing. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that coming back and just us being able to be able to do things in person again. I think pretty much all the same things that Abby just said. And I, uh, I just always get so excited when middle school and high school students come in and they, you know, they're, they're, they're making their zines sometimes for classes, which I think is amazing and fantastic. And so I really want them to be able to, to come in and explore more often. Well, thank you both so much uh, for your presentation. I know when I had a chance to visit the archive, uh, a couple years ago, I felt like a middle schooler because it was so exciting to like, especially like the tiny little zines or the ones that are in just like really unique formats and everything. It's, it's totally inspiring. So I'm so glad you guys were able to join us and share some of what you do. And everybody, please keep an eye out for when the library can reopen and you can visit uh, the archives in person yourselves. Um, so thank you guys so much. Um, Thank you so much for having us. It was really great to be a part of this. Yeah, thanks. And again, any questions, send to zines at spl.org and we can answer your questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, coming up at noon is going to be the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, Cynthia Sears Artist Book Collection. Um, so we're going to just take a quick break and we should be back a couple minutes after noon. Thank you, everybody.